Welcome to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe, and this is a place where we don't rely on good luck or good genes for our health and happiness, but rather we create it with our thoughts and our actions each and every single day. Each week, I'll bring you a thought or a guest that will help you live your happiest and healthiest life. Are you ready? Is there such a thing as the best diet? This episode comes as a result of multiple inquiries on Instagram and through my website, mariamarlo.com, about the best diet one should follow. In particular, I've been getting asked a lot about the keto diet, most recently from Lynn V on Instagram. So shout out to you, Lynn, for inspiring this episode. And I know you also mentioned something about being too old to change because you're in your 50s. It's absolutely not true. You can make a change and improve your health dramatically at any age. It's never, never too late to start. So for anyone listening who feels like you've tried everything before and it hasn't worked or that maybe you're just meant to be overweight or meant to be unhealthy, it's not the case. When you figure out the best diet for you, you will regain health and you can reach an ideal weight. Now, before we jump in, I do want to remind you guys, if you have a health and wellness question that you would like to be turned into a podcast episode, you can submit them to me on Instagram. It's at Maria Marlo and Marlo is M-A-R-L-O-W-E. And you may see your question or hear your question as an upcoming podcast episode. Now, to make sure that you never miss an episode of the Happier and Healthier podcast, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. And you can also sign up sign up for my weekly newsletter, email newsletter, and you could do that on mariamarlo.com. It also comes with delicious, healthy recipes each week and some nutrition tips and advice. So, is there such a thing as the best diet? The answer is yes and no. Now, I always say that when you ask, if you ask 10 different people what a healthy diet is, you'll get 10 different answers. And I actually did this. I pulled people on Instagram, on Instagram stories, and I did get all sorts of different answers. Of course, you guys, my listeners are a little bit more educated. So I did get some um, some really, really great answers. But for uh, they were all great answers. But you know, sometimes I would hear um, keto or paleo or vegan, um, and the the truth is there is not just one diet that works for every single person, and there's not even a diet that's necessarily going to work for you for your entire lifetime. Maybe, maybe it is, but for example, if you develop some sort of condition or illness, there may be a specific diet that you need to follow for a length of time in order to bring you back to health. And then once you're healed, you can then change up your diet a little bit. Now, I know you've all heard the sayings that food is medicine or you are what you eat. I'm sure you've heard both of these phrases a million times each. So I know you've heard them, but my question to you is, do you actually believe them? And if so, do you actually put them into practice in your life? A lot of us are struggling with chronic health issues and not just weight. Uh, I think weight is often the issue that will prompt us to seek a healthier way of eating or a healthier diet. But the truth is millions and millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people have chronic illnesses, whether it's uh, diabetes or whether it's heart disease or whether it's rosacea and eczema and acne and just all these chronic conditions that we get used to feeling unwell and we don't realize that we can actually do something about it with our diet. So just one common example, I remember when I was growing up and in high school, everyone would talk about PMS, right? And whenever it was that time of the month, you were going to get cramps, you were going to get bloated, you were going to be in pain. 
I just thought that that's the way that it is. I'm a woman, I'm screwed, and this is what happens once a month because that's what was happening to everyone around me. I remember Midol was advertised quite a bit, which is a pain reliever for PMS pain. And I just took took that as, as the way that it is. However, those symptoms could actually be due to nutritional deficiencies or eating inflammatory foods and certain foods that could be triggering them and basically taking our body out of that perfect balance. So now that I have had a healthy diet for over 10 years, I can tell you I've never had a cramp since or never had PMS. In fact, I wouldn't even know my period was coming if I didn't track it, right? So you don't have to be in pain and our body is not meant to not feel good. We're not meant to not have energy or to be fatigued or to be bloated or to have some strange rash. Like our body is not meant for that. And I really encourage you to always be a body detective. That's what I tell my clients. Be a body detective and don't take any symptoms as just the way that it is or just because a lot of times these things can be tracked back to our diet. So I went off on a little tangent here to bring it back. I just want to really make it clear that, of course, a healthy diet can help you lose weight, but did you know that a healthy diet could also help you reverse heart disease? So for example, my own mother, who was diagnosed with heart disease last year and then drastically changed her diet was able to reverse heart disease. Another example is with autoimmune conditions. So countless people have reversed autoimmune conditions by optimizing their diet. An example would be Dr. Terry Walls, who was a traditional MD, and she developed MS, which put her eventually in a wheelchair. And she was just getting progressively worse and worse and worse, despite the fact that she was following all of the conventional treatments. Because she was growing frustrated and she was an avid um, athlete, I think she biked quite a bit prior to her diagnosis, and now she couldn't because she was wheel- in a wheelchair, she started to dig into the research and she drastically changed her diet and lo and behold, she is now back to running and swimming and hiking and walking and said goodbye to her wheelchair. Another example would be with cancer. So many people have put their cancer into remission by focusing on optimizing their diet. Chris Carr would be one example. She's quite well known as an author. Uh, Another example would be my friend Liana Werner-Gray, who was just on the podcast recently for her book, Cancer Free with Food. And she talks about all these foods that have the power to help your body fight cancer. All of these examples that I've given you of these specific people, they all optimize their diet in order to heal their body. But the diet that each of these people used is not exactly the same. Are they similar? Yes, very much so. But depending on what you have going on in your body at the time, that is going to influence the real specifics of what exactly you should be eating or avoiding. And it really comes down to your personal biochemistry. It comes down to your microbiome. It comes down to your gut health, your immunity, and and just your health in general. So let's first talk about the similarities between any sort of healing diet. Then later on, we'll get into the specifics. Healing diets are going to be low glycemic, which means they're not going to spike your blood sugar very much. And this has really been shown to be one of the healthiest ways of eating. And it's something that you will see in all of the healthiest diets and the diets that bring the most results, not only in terms of weight loss, but in overall health. The reason that these diets are low glycemic is because they typically avoid completely or have very, very small amounts of any sort of refined carbohydrates, any sort of flours or sugar. So sugar is usually not in a the healthiest types of diets. Fruit, fine, but uh, like actual refined sugar, you're not going to find that in the healthiest diets. 
What you will find a ton of across the healthiest diets and the diets that heal is a ton of vegetables. Now, you know that I'm all about the vegetables. I've made it my mission to help people eat more vegetables because I think it's really the single most effective and important thing change that we can make in our diet to make an impact on our health, no matter what our health goals are. Study after study confirms their wide ranging benefits from weight loss to they're such a great source of fiber. So they help improve our digestion and keep everything moving in and out very easily and smoothly. They're loaded with antioxidants that we need. So not even just the vitamins that we know, vitamin A, vitamin C, but they have all sorts of phytochemicals, some of which we have not even identified yet, and we don't fully understand how they work to support our health. So vegetables, any sort of healing diet is going to be very focused on vegetables. doesn't mean that it's 100% vegetarian or vegan, but vegetables by far make up the biggest portion. So if you've been following me for a while or you read my website, a while back, a couple years ago, I did a post on what I call the ideal plate ratio. And I created this for my clients because it was in my opinion, the easiest way for them to remember how to fill their plate, no matter where they are. Because a lot of my people in New York or LA in these big cities, they are eating out a lot. Some people think that if you eat out a lot that you can't possibly eat very healthfully. And that's not actually true. Of course, when you're cooking at home, you have the most influence over what goes into your dishes and of course have the power to use the healthiest ingredients. But when you're eating out, there are steps you can take to create a healthy plate, even if it's not exactly on the menu. One of the biggest factors of this ideal plate ratio is that at least 50% if not 75% of your plate, is made up by vegetables, which this is quite a revolutionary uh, thought, right? Because traditionally, vegetables were thought of as a side dish. It's actually reversed. So vegetables should really be your main dish and your protein should be your side dish. Keep that ideal plate ratio in mind wherever you are, and that will really help you make sure that you are getting enough vegetables in every single day. Now, protein is also a critical part of that ideal plate ratio, and you want about a quarter of your plate to be made up with some sort of protein. So it could be plant-based or it could be animal-based. And I do think after my experience and after experimenting with so many different diets and uh, working with people with so many different diets, I do think that the healthiest type of diet does include some animal protein. It doesn't have to be an enormous amount. In fact, it can't be, right? Because 50 to 75% of what you're eating is still vegetables, but animal products do hold a part on a healthy plate. They do offer us certain nutrients, certain amino acids, and and things that we can't necessarily get from plants. For example, vitamin B12 is very well known in the vegan world because vegans have to supplement with B12 because it's highly unlikely that they'll get an adequate amount through a plant-based diet. In fact, the majority of plant-based foods do not have B12 And there's really only two where you can get some bioactive B12. And they are nori, which is a type of seaweed. Typically, your sushi is wrapped in nori. And the other one is tempeh, which is a type of fermented soy. Spirulina is commonly cited as a source of B12. However, the B12 in spirulina is not biologically available and is therefore not a good source for B12 for a vegan. A few other things that you'll only find in animal products and not in plants are creatine, carnosine, vitamin D3, which is a very critical nutrient. You can find vitamin D2 in plant-based foods, but you're not going to find vitamin D3. You're also not going to find DHA, which is uh, one of the omega-3 fatty acids. Now, plant-based foods do contain omega-3. So for example, hemp seeds, chia seeds, walnuts do have omega-3, 
but they have the type of omega-3 called ALA. Now your body can create DHA from ALA, however it's not a very efficient process and so you're not going to get the amount of DHA from eating plant-based foods as you would if you ate a animal-based source of omega-3 which is already naturally high in DHA. And lastly another example would be heme iron. So plant-based foods do contain iron but they contain a different type of iron called non-heme iron. Animal-based iron or heme iron is much better absorbed, more readily absorbed in the body versus the plant-based iron. And plant-based iron can be affected by anti-nutrients such as phytic acid, which is often found in plant foods. So even though a food may contain iron, you may not actually absorb as much of that iron as you would think. The biggest thing to keep in mind with animal products is that quality is key. So conventional animal products do not have any place in a healthy diet, and that I would say avoid 100% completely. But conventional animal products are very different from organic and pasture-raised animal products. I go through these differences and exactly what you want to choose with each type of animal product in my book, The Real Food Grocery Guide. In short, though, I just want to give you an example that will illustrate the very big differences between these two products. Conventional animals are typically given subtherapeutic doses of antibiotics. The animals are given these antibiotics because the farmers have figured out that when you give an animal a small amount of antibiotics over a long period of time, it actually helps fatten them up. Because these farmers get paid by the pound and not the quality, they've adopted this as a practice which is very, very widespread amongst conventional animal farmers. The problem is not only that we end up consuming this meat that has the animal has been consuming antibiotics their entire life, so we are getting some of that remnant. The The bigger problem is that this practice is leading to antibiotic resistant bacteria. The rise in antibiotic resistant bacteria is regarded as the biggest public health threat our generation is facing by the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, by the World Health Organization, and by many health organizations across the globe. One of the biggest causes of the rise in antibiotic resistant bacteria is the overuse of antibiotics. And one of the places that we severely overuse antibiotics is in the raising of livestock, which then becomes our food. The unfortunate part about this growing or looming epidemic is that You don't have to actually eat the conventional meat to be affected by the rise in antibiotic resistant bacteria. So yes, it's possible that you could get a strain of antibiotic resistant bacteria by eating meat or some sort of animal product that is tainted with it. However, you could also pick it up from someone else or maybe you go to the hospital for a routine operation and you pick it up there. And even though you didn't eat the meat um, that maybe caused it, you could still be affected by it. So antibiotics in our livestock is just one of the many causes for the growth in antibiotic resistant bacteria, but it is one of the biggest ones. And so by choosing organic, not only are you limiting your exposure to antibiotics, you're also helping to prevent or at least slow down the rise of antibiotic resistant bacteria and help prevent it from becoming a full blown epidemic. All right, back to some of the similarities between the healthiest healing diets. So they have a lot of vegetables, they have high quality organic and pasture raised animal products in small amounts. They also have plenty of healthy good fats. So please, please, please do not be scared of avocados. They will not make you fat. Olive oil is another excellent healthy fat. Coconut has healthy fat, uh, nuts, seeds. So there's plenty of places that you can get healthy fats. And again, these will not make you fat as is or was once commonly believed. They are very much a important part. Healthy fats are an important part and 
protective part of the diet. So those three things, a majority of vegetables, high quality protein and animal products, and healthy fats are some of the similarities that are gonna unite all healthy healing diets. So some of the styles of eating that would fit into that criteria would be the Mediterranean diet. This is often regarded as the healthiest diet or one of the healthiest diets. The problem with the Mediterranean diet is that even though it has all this amazing stuff in it, such as the vegetables and wild seafood, olive oil, it also does contain some refined carbohydrates, which are high glycemic and are not health promoting at all. So that's the one thing I will mention there. The paleo diet definitely falls in line with this and has been very helpful for a lot of people. Many people do a healthy version of paleo, but some do not. So some people take paleo or the caveman diet to mean just meat, 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 and they're putting bacon and steak on their plate at every meal and not enough vegetables. So that is one downfall of paleo in general. Keto could qualify as meeting these criteria. However, it's possible that it could become way too meat and protein heavy and not actually balanced by vegetables. On the keto diet, they do restrict starchy vegetables and anything sweet like fruit, even though it's natural, which I think can leave you missing out on certain nutrients and antioxidants that are found in these foods. As an example, blueberries are often touted as one of the healthiest, most antioxidant-rich foods. Uh, we just talked about it as one of the most powerful anti-cancer foods on a recent episode. And on a keto diet, you have to actually restrict your blueberries because they are a bit, a bit sugary. So beyond all that, I do think that a keto diet is also hard to really uphold correctly and to implement it on a day-to-day -day basis. If you want a more thorough discussion of keto, then definitely check out my episode with Dr. Axe where we discuss it in further detail. And I do think if you are gonna try the keto diet, his version of it is definitely superior to just trying to do keto on your own and figuring out how much of what to eat on your own. Now, all of that said, if I was to have to choose the healthiest diet in general, in my opinion, that would be the Pegan diet. The Pegan diet marries the best of all of these styles of eating. Of course, though, I'm still a believer that there is no such thing as a one diet fits all. And I think the Pecan diet is a great starting point and then making small tweaks to it based on your present condition and your present health is what is going to help heal your health. So let me first explain what a Pecan diet is and then I'll explain how you figure out those specific tweaks. So Pegan stands for paleo and vegan, and as you can imagine, it takes the best of both of these styles of eating. It is primarily plant-based, definitely 50 to 75% of a Pegan diet at least is vegetables. There are small amounts of high quality organic animal products, and there's of course plenty of healthy fats. It's a low glycemic diet because it does not have any processed or refined foods. So a couple of the things that are missing in the Pegan diet and really any type of healing diet, they're also not included in a paleo diet, for example, would be gluten and dairy. I know this is hard for a lot of people to wrap their head around, especially because humans have been eating bread for, you know, as long as humans were in existence practically. So I know it's really hard for people to wrap their head around. In fact, when I was in nutrition school, one of the professors, um, when I was at NYU, actually went on this whole trade one day on how gluten-free is just a marketing thing and that the majority of people do not have to be gluten-free, shouldn't be gluten-free. Only the 3% of the population that has celiac has to avoid gluten. No one else does. Unfortunately, that's not the case. People who do not have celiac can still have a gluten sensitivity and still be negatively affected by gluten. And in fact, if you have a gluten sensitivity but ignore it and don't stop eating gluten, it could turn into full-blown celiac disease down the line. 
The problem with gluten is that it increases the levels of zonulin in our intestines. Now this is true for many, if not most people. Some would even say all people. It depends which study you're, you're reading. Now the amount of zonulin released in people that have celiac or who have gluten sensitivity is much, much higher than someone who doesn't, but someone who doesn't have those issues, they will still experience an increase in zonulin. And when our zonulin levels are increased, our tight junctions open. So tight junctions are essentially what hold together the lining of your intestines. So if you think that your lining is basically a row of cells, it's like a single layer of cells, those cells are held together by tight junctions. The tight junctions, their role is to allow nutrients from the intestines to go out into the bloodstream but they're supposed to stay closed and keep everything else that's in your intestines keep that inside what happens when our zonulin increases our tight junctions loosen and open up and then particles from inside our intestines can leak out into our bloodstream so this includes food particles toxins microbes whatever is in there could actually leak out. There is a body of research to show that when we have leaky gut, this is the precursor to developing an autoimmune condition. Earlier, I mentioned Dr. Terry Walls as someone who has reversed her MS, reversed her symptoms of MS through diet. There's also Dr. Amy Myers, who had a similar story. She didn't have MS. I forgot exactly what she had, but she was able to put her autoimmune disease into remission and get rid of the symptoms by optimizing her diet as well. And one of the biggest components of any sort of diet that is going to heal an autoimmune condition is focusing on digestion. And I should just say, the one of the most important parts of healing any condition is focusing on digestion and making sure that your digestion is strong and it's not compromised in any way and it's definitely not leaky. Our gut is the root of our health. And on earlier episodes, I've had Dr. Pedre on, who is a gut health expert. He talked a lot about this, how our gut and our immune system are very intricately intertwined. And so if your gut and your digestion is unhealthy or it's not working properly, chances are your immune system is not working as effectively as it could be. So it's really important, no matter what issue that you're dealing with, whether it's skin issues or some sort of chronic health issues, autoimmune, you have to focus on repairing the gut. So one one of the ways that we do this is by removing these inflammatory foods and removing foods that could be, for example, causing leaky gut, like gluten. And additionally, we also have to actually strategically repair it with different supplements and adding in certain foods, for example, bone broth um, and other things that are going to help heal that gut lining. So gluten is one thing that is not in a vegan diet or a healing diet. Dairy is another one. Most people cannot digest dairy after childhood. Certain cultures can, like certain Nordic cultures tend to do better with dairy than others. But Even Harvard Medical School has said pretty clearly that dairy is not a necessary part of the human diet. It is not the only nor the best source of calcium, as is commonly believed. And in fact, dark leafy greens are some of the best sources of calcium because they also contain magnesium. So you actually absorb quite a bit of the calcium and magnesium from your dark leafy greens. Plus, if you just think about it, where do you think the cow is getting her calcium from? Because cows eat dark leafy greens, aka grass, all day long. So those are some of the main principles. If you want to read more, do head to my blog post. You could just Google Maria Marlow Pegan and it will come up or you can head to my website and it really lays out all of the guidelines. I truly believe that this is a excellent place for the majority of people, it works so effectively because it really removes the most damaging foods for our health and adds in the healthiest foods. So if you're coming off of a standard American diet or just a relatively unhealthy diet, this, these changes alone, 
eating the vegan way will make a huge, huge impact. But like I said earlier, there is no one diet that works for every single person perfectly. You really have to tweak it based on your specific unique body. One person's food can be another person's poison. And even something that we generally think of as healthy, for example, a salad can be unhealthy and not good for a certain person. So for example, if someone has IBS or has an inflamed gut, Eating a whole ton of raw fiber is really not the best thing to put in your gut at that point in time. Instead, you would want to choose cooked vegetables, right? That's one example. Another example could be something like tomatoes. Tomatoes are a very healthy food, right? Well, for some people, they actually cause inflammation because they're part of the nightshade family and some people are sensitive to those types of fruits and vegetables. So for that person, consuming tomatoes and supposedly healthy food is actually unhealthy for them. So how do you figure out which specific foods to eat or to avoid? You can do that through testing. Now you can do a lot with elimination. Let me just backtrack a second. Elimination diets are great for proving to yourself that things like gluten and dairy and some of these big common allergens are not great for you. An elimination diet is something I do with my clients a lot. You could even attempt it on your own. Essentially, you just remove a certain food group for a period at minimum two weeks, and then you see how you feel. If your symptoms that you were complaining of before disappear, it's a good indicator that this food was not doing very good for your body. And then if you reintroduce it after those two weeks and then you have a flare up of those symptoms, that's really a quite clear signal from your body that this food is doing more harm than good, in which case you would want to continue to avoid it. Now, what about things like tomatoes or blueberries, right? Because blueberries are a healthy food. However, if your digestion is impaired, you may not actually be absorbing the nutrients from all this organic produce that you're spending all your money on. So you really want to test your gut and know what's going on inside of there. And that's going to help you figure out the best foods for you. So back in episode 38, I interviewed the chief scientific officer of Viome. His name is Momo Vujicic. He is a PhD in biochemistry and a very, very interesting man. I highly recommend if you have not listened to that episode, definitely go check it out. His whole belief is that basically any illness can be cured with food and by optimizing the diet. His story was he spent, I think, 12 years at Los Alamos Laboratory studying genomics and the microbiome, amongst other things. Then after he healed his rheumatoid arthritis by optimizing his diet, he left to start Viome. Viome offers a DNA stool test, so you give them a very small stool sample, and they will come back to you with the complete breakdown of what's in your gut because it's a DNA test. So it picks up literally every organism that's in there. Typically, when you go to the doctor or gastroenterologist complaining about some digestive issues, they'll have to choose specific tests based on what they think you might have. So they might do one test for one thing, another test for another thing. And the great thing about Viome is that it really picks up everything. So Just to give you an example, both my fiance and I did the Viome test and he was having some digestive issues and had went to a doctor and the doctor had given him multiple tests that he had to do and didn't find anything in particular that was of any concern to him. However, when he did the Viome test, there were actually some concerning things in there. Now that Viome has identified the or at least one of the reasons for his issues we can get him adequate treatment for it for the list of microbes that you'll get you can of course scan through there and see if you recognize anything but you probably really won't know what's good or bad or what's going on in there 
so that you could take that to a functional medicine doctor, integrative medicine doctor, nutritionist, someone who can understand it a little bit better for you, and they can give you some insights. But where Viome really shines is that it also gives you a very specific list of foods to eat or avoid based on the microbes in your gut. So I learned a ton of really interesting things. Again, I already have a quite healthy diet, but going through this biome, I learned a lot about me. And now that I've started to put it in practice for a few weeks, it's making a lot of sense. So I'm going to do a blog post where I'm going to share completely about my results from biome, but I want to talk a little bit about it now. So some interesting things. I, I didn't have too many foods that I have to avoid, so maybe there's maybe there's about 10 things and some of the things I don't eat anyway, but a couple really interesting points that I found. So two things that I'm supposed to avoid are asparagus and bell peppers, and I actually hate both of these things. Uh, they, they repel me, and you know I love my vegetables, but these are two things that I really highly dislike. So it's just kind of interesting that my body doesn't like them and uh, they're they're not great for me. So for example, with asparagus, it says that there's histamine contained in asparagus, which would likely increase inflammation and, and worsen my inflammatory score. And this was really interesting. Apparently I have a number of different plant viruses. So the reason that I'm supposed to avoid bell peppers is because my microbiome contains pepper mild model virus, which is known to cause disease in bell pepper. Since plant viruses in the microbiome could potentially cause immune system activation in humans, it's recommended you avoid bell pepper. That is really gross, um, but that's not the only vegetable virus that I had. So I have bell pepper, cucumber, and shallots. So those I have to avoid. I also have to avoid chickpeas, which was quite possibly the saddest news that I ever heard. Although I kind of felt like I was going to get this, uh, this suggestion. I do eat a lot of them. And while typically they're you know, traditionally they've been fine for me. I have felt like recently they have, I, I've been getting a little bloated after I would eat them. So it says chickpeas contain agglutinin, which has been shown to impair the absorption or utilization of essential nutrients if it is not degraded by specific microbes. So essentially I no longer have, I guess, the microbes that are needed to break the agglutinin down. It also suggested that I avoid quinoa because it's likely to increase inflammation and worsen my in inflammatory score. I'm also advised to avoid amaranth, cashews, lentils, sh uh, shallot, I said, turkey, and wild rice. So my my list of foods to avoid wasn't too bad. Cush's, my fiance's, was like a laundry list. It was just crazy. The app also tells you your superfoods. So for me, it was a lot of the cruciferous vegetables, things like cabbage and Brussels sprouts, chard, also some fresh herbs like dill, garlic, ghee, green tea, olive oil, olives, oregano. So I have a quite nice long list of foods that are my superfoods. So these are foods that are really gonna help support my microbiome. Salmon, wild caught is also on there yams, turmeric, sauerkraut. So it was definitely a good long list. And then it also gives you sort of these in-between foods, which foods you might want to limit or minimize. So for example, I got anchovies to minimize. I got um, barley, beef, fatty, grass-fed, but beef, lean, grass-fed was okay. So that's kind of interesting. And it really just gives you detailed lists. I, I don't know how many are in there here, but I would say definitely over 100, if not hundreds of different foods. Basically any sort of whole food is in this uh, Viome app and it will tell you whether you enjoy it, avoid it, or minimize it. Now, while overall I'm very satisfied with the Viome test and my results and I have started to enact the suggestions, one area where I think it did fall short is that it did tell me that I could eat gluten and dairy, which as you now know, I very strongly believe are not healthy for anyone. In fact, I know they're definitely not healthy for me because when I do eat them, they do cause an immediate negative reaction. 
Now, I'm not sure if the reason it didn't flag these for me is because I haven't actually eaten them in a very long time. So maybe there's just no marker there there for them. Uh, but whatever the case is, Viome does have a little caveat that basically if it tells you to eat a food that or that a food is okay that you know is not good for you, then definitely avoid it. This is not 100% foolproof, but it does give you a pretty accurate representation of what you should um, be eating or avoiding. If you want to test your own microbiome and get those personalized dietary suggestions, you can check out Viome. Head to viome.com forward slash Marlo. That's V-I-O-M-E dot com forward slash M-A-R-L-O-W-E. And you'll get 50% off your kit. Now, I want to just kind of finally to close up, I, I do want to offer a couple anecdotes to uh, really drive this point home a little bit deeper of how food is our medicine and to find the best diet you really need to be a body detective and optimize you can't just sort of take an off-the-rack diet like the paleo diet or the vegan diet or the keto diet because it's not going to necessarily work for you I know plenty of people men and women who the keto diet has done really well for them they feel great they've reached their optimal weight and they're feeling good I've also heard from multiple people that the keto diet was making them lose their memory and they felt like they couldn't remember anything so they ended up going back to a more paleo or vegan style of eating with the vegan diet, a lot of people feel great on it for a period of time, but sometimes over time they start to not feel great. And I want to talk about the vegan diet in particular for a little bit because I do promote a very plant-based lifestyle and so I know sometimes a lot of times people think that I'm vegan and I, I was vegan many, many years ago for a short period of time. But I think just because I talk so much about vegetables, people automatically assume that I'm vegan but I'm not. And there's, in fact, seafood recipes on my website. Um, and I talk about these kinds of foods um, in my book and in my programs. Here's the thing. A vegan diet coming from like a whole food plant-based diet, let me clarify, right? Because a vegan diet could be Oreos and, you know, cookies and things. A whole food plant-based diet that is 100% vegan can be a huge, huge improvement, especially coming from the standard American diet. However, it is very easy to develop deficiencies as a vegan. And what's more, it could, because many vegan diets are or include a lot of beans, lentils, and whole grains, including wheat, you could end up with digestive issues and eventually even autoimmune conditions because of leaky gut. So let me give you two examples. I'll actually give you three examples. So before I mentioned Dr. Terry Walls and how she developed MS, well, she was a vegetarian for 20 years. When she started digging in the research and looking at her nutrient levels and just looking at what she was eating and how her body was at that moment, she realized that she actually needed to add in animal products. And it was very, very hard for her, she's written about this, that she was not only vegetarian for health purposes, but for, for moral purposes. And she found it very hard to wrap her head around in the beginning that she had to start including animal proteins in there. Uh, eventually she did, and eventually she healed her MS. So that's just one example. Um, another example is also uh, Dr. Amy Myers, who healed her autoimmune condition, and she was also a vegetarian for, I think, at least a decade before she developed her autoimmune condition. And I want to tell you about me as well. So I grew up eating a very standard American diet. I pretty much just ate pizza, cookies, Entenmann's cheese danish, McDonald's and t-bone steak that was actually my my favorite thing to eat my dad was best friends with a butcher and so we would always have steak and milk and cheese and all this like it was an italian deli so like all this amazing meat and, and animal products which was not organic of course anyway it tastes it tasted good at the time 
So that's what I grew up on. I come from a family where obesity is the norm, not the exception, where pretty much everyone, including like the younger people, not just the older people, has at least one chronic condition. And so for me, illness and weight problems were just a regular part of of my life at that time because that's all I know and, and that's, you know, that's what we were eating. When I got to college and I started experimenting with my diet, I originally did it because I wanted to clear up my acne. And I realized when I took the meat out and when I took the dairy out, it made a huge impact on my skin. And so I eventually started going towards the the vegan the vegan direction and was actually vegan for a period of time there were not as many resources are as there are now and not like a ton of education about it so for me a vegan diet basically meant whole wheat everything I was eating whole wheat bread, I was eating whole wheat crackers, I was eating whole wheat cookies, vegan cookies, because I thought, oh, it's a vegan cookie, so it must be healthy, Uh, right? So I made all of those mistakes, and I really thought that I was actually eating very healthy at the time, but over a period of time, I did develop an autoimmune condition. Now, let me just back that up and say I was having a lot of digestive issues at that time as well. So I was having to run to the bathroom every time I ate my breakfast cereal in the morning. I was sneezing after I ate my whole wheat bread, you know, toast, whatever I was eating, avocado toast. Um, And I, I did have multiple signs that what I was eating wasn't good for me. But at that time, I didn't realize those little signals like me sneezing or me having to run to the bathroom or having diarrhea or whatever the case was, having pain, having bloating. I didn't realize that that was my body. Like, hey, Maria, wake up. Like, please stop feeding us this because you're inflaming your gut and you're you're hurting your body. So I didn't realize that back then. But in retrospect, I can see how my overconsumption of wheat led to presumably leaky gut, which then led to my autoimmune condition. So I have something called morphia, which is a form of scleroderma, which basically my skin sort of attacks itself and creates scar tissue for absolutely no reason. Now, when I first got got it, it started off small and then it sort of grew to this huge shiny patch on my chest. And then eventually, um, as I started to optimize my diet, and my stress and everything, uh, it did actually go away. Uh, But then it did recently come back. And so now I know that I have to really focus on eating what's called the AIP protocol or the autoimmune paleo protocol. This is very similar to the Pegan diet, but there are some specific changes and specific foods. Like for example, a big part of the AIP protocol is consuming organ meats. So for example, liver. Now, someone with an autoimmune condition, this is really important for them to get the nutrients they need and to heal their body to get back to health. However, if you don't have an autoimmune condition and you don't want to eat organ meat, you, you may not have to. Uh, it definitely can offer health benefits, but you, if you have no reason to really consume it, you don't have to, right? So this is another example of how you really need to figure out the best foods for your unique body. And while I haven't confirmed it with any additional testing, I do think that my results from the Viome test do suggest that I have leaky gut, which would make sense because I have been eating a lot of beans, especially now that I recently moved and it's a little bit harder to get the highest quality animal products and it was harder to get wild seafood, for example. So I was just relying very heavily on beans and lentils which can also open tight junctions. It's not just gluten, it's also things like chickpeas, for example. In small amounts, for many people, they shouldn't be problematic. However, for others who are more susceptible to them or who are eating a very large quantity of them, like myself, that's when you can run into trouble with them. 
So it was interesting that Viom did pick that up and suggest that certain things like quinoa and chickpeas and certain grains that I do avoid because of um, the components of them and also because it could worsen my inflammation. So I am going to follow the recommendations in the app and I'm also going to just generally start the AIP protocol. I to be honest with you, you know, for so long I felt like I ate so healthy and I had tried the AIP protocol and because I was coming from mostly a plant-based diet and apparently because I can't digest fatty beef, when I first started it, I just went crazy on eating beef and bone broth and all these things and it sent me straight to the bathroom and was making me sick. So I was like, okay, fine, like I cannot eat beef like I I just you know it doesn't sit right with me it makes me sick like so I basically just stopped being strict on the AIP diet but what what Viome also reaffirmed is that okay for whatever reason I can't digest fatty meat however um, I can apparently or I should be able to have lean leaner meat so what I have found is that I can take bison like bison meat Um, organic grass-fed I can digest perfectly fine and do really well with it similarly other types of meat I do fine with so in terms of really figuring out that best diet for you I think it's a mix of trial and error that's definitely a huge part of it but also you can sort of fast track that by doing some sort of microbiome test that will give you more targeted uh, guidelines to follow and will kind of um, push you forward a bit faster than just doing trial and error on your own. Another last example I want to give you with diet. So if you guys follow me on Instagram, you know about a year ago, and I think I also mentioned this earlier, my mom woke up one morning and her ankles and legs were extremely swollen and retaining water. So uh, this, of course, terrified her. She went straight to the, the doctor or emergency room and the doctor is basically like you're two days away from having a stroke my mom had extremely extremely high blood pressure and of course heart disease but really had no idea because she hadn't been to the doctor in decades this obviously scared her and so she did go on medication because it was like a very dangerous point at that point so she did go on medication but this really like woke her up and she decided to make huge changes in her diet and her lifestyle. So she definitely started eating more plant-based, although she didn't eat um, a ton of animal products before, but she definitely was not like super, you know, she didn't care if it was organic or not and things like that. And she did have a lot of sugar and bread and refined carbohydrates and gluten that really made up the bulk of, of her diet. So long story short, I had read from um, Dr. William Davis in, it was either on Doctored or his earlier book, uh, Wheat Belly, about the impact that wheat has on the heart. So I really highly, highly encouraged her to uh, not only go plant-based, like more plant-based, but, or like the, basically the vegan diet. But also that, that key component is, of course, removing um, removing gluten. And so fast forward to today, which is uh, about a year later, she is in great health. In fact, she's in better health than she's ever been. And before this episode, she was struggling with a number of health issues that she would just brush off as normal. So one, she would have digestive issues all of the time. She would brush them off. Why? Because she had them all of the time and she just thought they were normal. She just thought, oh, this this must be my body. So she would brush them off, would not address them. And then the other issue she had is she had hurt her back somehow. I think she had slipped and come down on her knee or something and like her hip, you know, her hip uh, started hurting. So she she was having some pain there or maybe it was, it was like her hip and then it started going to her back. And she was going to chiropractors and the pain would kind of come and go. Sometimes it would be worse. Sometimes it could get better. And this persisted for for quite some time. I'm talking like months and months, uh, maybe like the better part of a year. And uh, she 
like I said, it would, you know, it would come and go. And, and one, uh, one afternoon before she had this whole um, heart disease episode or, you know, at the hospital, she came to visit me and we were supposed to go spend the Saturday at the Union Square Farmer's Market. And when she arrived, she looked like she was crippled, like she literally could not walk. She was moving her feet like a little old granny, which my mom is not that old. And, you know, earlier I'd seen her uh, a week earlier and she was she was walking just fine. So it's for me to see this was, was very, very scary and very unsettling. Long story short, like I, she was also having like crazy digestive issues at the time. And I really urged her. I'm like, please, like you have to stop eating gluten. Like I asked her, what'd you have for breakfast? She had an English muffin. So I just, I just knew the two were related. Unfortunately, uh, parents just don't like listening to their children. Uh, so she, she didn't, you know, she, she kept it out for a little while, but she, she just couldn't understand that bread, what she served at church, right? Um, uh, bread, that bread could be such a cause of her issues anyway long story short after the heart um heart scare she did take out 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 gluten because i really urged her and said that there is a pretty significant link between the two so not only did she heal her heart her digestive issues disappeared and which she was struggling with for years by the way and she no longer has that back and hip pain it literally disappeared so she really thought it was like the ma- way that she moved or was walking or like, you know, if she would rehit it or something like that, that that was triggering it. And maybe that would help kind of set it off. But it was really what she was eating that was inflaming her and causing this excruciating pain to the point where she sometimes couldn't walk. She had to lay down and and all of that. You know, I share these stories and her, my story and her story with permission uh, because, I, you know, I, I just... Uh, knowing is not the same as doing and you know even like with my own mom like she knows all the things she has my book you know she she's been watching me you know do this for for years and years and years and so she knows all the information but she wasn't actually implementing it so I really urge you if you're listening to take what you're learning and take what you know and put it into action when you upgrade your diet you seriously upgrade your entire life. And when you feel better, you you have a better life, right? You're happier, you're you have more energy and you can just live a fuller life. So it's not just your immediate health that will improve, it's literally your entire life. Don't get discouraged, don't feel like you're starting too late, don't feel like you've done so much damage you can't possibly repair it. No, 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 none of that is true. You can start in any moment and the amazing thing is that every single day you have the power to make a new choice. In fact, every single meal you have the power to make a new choice. You wield immense power with your fork. So don't get discouraged, just work on it. And dietary changes, some of them will give you nearly instantaneous results. You can see huge improvements and huge differences in your health in just a few days by making simple changes, by adding things in or taking things out. But to heal a condition, like to heal an autoimmune disease, that's not going to happen overnight. And so you do have to stick with it and you have to give it time and you have to have faith. So just don't give up. That's all I want to say is if you, um, you know, if you think you eat pretty healthy, but you still have some health issues, you may not be eating the healthiest diet for you. And if you don't eat healthy right now, that's totally okay. Like I said, you can always make a new choice. And if you are committed to feeling better, looking better, having better health, then you make that new choice to start today.